Hello, and welcome to Focus on the Bible. I am so glad that you are listening. I want to begin by inviting you to our services at Eastside, made at 9 o'clock for worship, followed by Bible classes for all ages at 9.30, and then at 10.30 for a second period of worship. In addition, we'll meet at 6 p.m. on Wednesday evenings for Bible study. Love to have you come and visit with us soon. This morning, I want to present to you a lesson that my grandfather preached, William Andrews, on August 20th, 1989, called, Why Am I Here? The Library of Congress, with its 192 million books, is considered to be one of the world's largest. And yet, if you would ramble through every one of those books, you'd find there's only one that would contain an answer to the four most important questions in all your life. And that is, who am I? Where did I come from? Where am I going? And why am I here? It would take a long time to answer all all those questions, even from this book. But this morning, I'd like for us to attempt to answer at least one of those. To me, perhaps the most important of the four. And that's the question of why am I here? You know, it's an interesting thing, but each one of us... simply occupies a little small niche in the history of mankind. We're here but for just a little while, and we're gone. It is said that life is swifter than a weaver's shuttle. It is like water that is poured upon the ground, and it vanisheth almost immediately. It's like grass, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven. Each of us occupies but a small portion of the timeline of earth life. Why am I here? God put me here for some reason. I read a little bit of humorous prose recently, and some of you may have read it, in which the mother was scolding her child because of his selfishness, and he said, she said, Johnny, don't you ever forget that God put us here to serve others. And after thinking about it a little bit, he said, Mother, why did he put the others here? You know, that statement of Mother does reflect perhaps the social gospel of the world today in which it is preached and taught and taught and practiced perhaps more than at any time in the history of the world that our whole life is tied up in serving others. No question about it, we have a responsibility. But I don't believe that that's why God put me here on this earth, just to serve others. I don't think you believe it either. You know, these questions, all four of them are vital questions. They have eternal consequences. There's no way in the world for us to slough them off or cast them aside and feel that we'll not simply dwell upon them at all, because inevitably they will return to trouble us in our twilight years. Why am I here? They need to be answered. And while we do that, let me remind you that the psalmist wrote in the 90th Psalm this statement. In comparing, of course, the the longevity of God, the eternal nature of him, to the transitoriness of man and this idea that we're here such a short time, he began by saying, from everlasting unto everlasting thou art God, verse 2. But down in the tenth verse, he began to say, but Lord, the days of our lives are threescore and ten. And if by reason of strength, that is, as we would say, health, four score. And then in verse 12, he adds this. Teach us, Lord, to number our days, and therefore present to thee an honest heart. It is so easy for us to deceive ourselves in thinking that we'll live forever. It seems that as the younger we are, the farther death seems to be from our mind, and the parting of these ways never crosses our attention. And Psalmist says, Lord, please teach us how to number our days. 
Most of you know Brother Laxley is in the insurance business. I asked him this way this past week. I said, Carrie, according to actuarial tables, what is the mortality rate of my woman today? And he said, a child being born today, if it is male, expects to live 71 years. If it's a female, it's 76. That's still short of the four score years that he said in Psalms 9, 90. Now, I don't know about your age, but I know mine. And this is what it looks like, and you can calculate yours. Four school years at 365 days a year gives me 29,200 days to live. If I live four score or 80, and if you do the same. Now, I know my age, and having calculated mine, I have already lived so many of those years that I've lived 23,000 plus days. I only have 5,640 left. Lord, teach me to number my days. How many days do you have left? Now, that's why it's important, people, to ask yourself the question, why am I here? Because if I don't know why I'm here, there's a good possibility that the 23,000-plus year days that I've lived has been spent in vain. Have I fulfilled the purpose for which God put me here? It's an important question. In answering that question, I believe there's no book that contains an answer that's more pointedly and certainly much uh, any more fulfilled than the book of Ecclesiastes. Because if I recall correctly, the book of Ecclesiastes is the story of an aged King Solomon who experienced the fullness of life. He tasted of its grandeur, he tasted of its glory, he tasted of all of its pleasures. And then in his aged years, he penned these words that he might advise the younger generation how they, they truly might spend their lives profitably in the service of God. And we want to examine that, but while we do so, there is something I, I need to remind you about. And that is that all of our learning, all of it, comes to us in only two ways. We either learn from our own experiences or we learn vicariously from the experiences and discoveries of others. Now there's no way, having read the book of Ecclesiastes, that I could even imagine that not only myself but you or anybody on the face of this earth today could possibly, conceivably, have the experiences that Solomon had. There's no way. And so this man has lived it, he has experienced it, and now he's giving us the information that we need in order to live in life more profitably. Solomon examined the four avenues that most people pursue in their lives, and perhaps in the pursuit thereof they are trying to answer for themselves the question, why am I here? What's my purpose? What's the meaning of life? But those four that he pursued was knowledge, and then pleasure, and then power or authority, and finally wealth. Those are the four avenues he tried. And in every one of those situations, he came to a very definite conclusion. Let's look at those briefly. Solomon was the most learned man of his day. He was an individual that garnered from all the storehouses of the world's knowledge, knowledge that he packed within himself day after day continuously. In fact, he was so acquainted with books, young people who are now in school and still struggling with them, he was so acquainted with them that he was forced to pen these words. Be admonished, young man, the making of books, there is no end, and much study is a weariness of the flesh. Bet a lot of you can say amen to that. But he was acquainted with study, he was acquainted with books, he was acquainted with knowledge. And besides that, you have to remember this, that while he may have very well been all the Einsteins rolled into one, he was more than that. Because... Solomon was an individual who prayed to God for wisdom, and God gave him wisdom. And God himself said of this very man, in 1 Kings 3.12, 
I have not risen a man before thee like unto thee, nor shall there come after thee a man like unto thee, for thou shalt in truly be endowed with wisdom. He was the wisest man that ever walked on the face of this earth. He was a man of wisdom to utilize the knowledge that he had. And he had all the knowledge that he could possibly gather. But the big question is, what did this have to do with helping him answer the question of life itself and its meaning, its purpose, and whether or not he could serve God just with knowledge? And here's his answer in the first chapter of Ecclesiastes, beginning in verse 10. I spoke to mine own heart, saying, Lo, I have come to great estate and have gotten more wisdom than they that have been before me in Jerusalem. Yea, my heart had great experience of wisdom and knowledge, and I gave my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and to know folly, and I perceive that this also is but a striving after the wind. Some versions read a vexation of the spirits, a tormented of mind, a striving after the wind. Did you ever try to catch the wind? You can't get a handle on it. Try all though you wish. He said it's striving after the wind. It serves no lasting purpose. Well, having pursued the area of knowledge and finding that it's like trying to catch the wind, he said, I sought out pleasure. Now, this is good pleasure. It's not illicit pleasure. In fact, most of the things that Solomon did were things that you and I could do, with one exception. We'll get to that one. Solomon said, I built me summer palaces, and I built me winter estates. I built me lakes and pools and lagoons. I had great gardens and orchards and vineyards. I had me men singers and women singers. I had me men musicians and women musicians to entertain me and charm my soul. And he went on saying, I had expensive furniture overlaid with gold and silver and precious stone. Now, mind you, that wasn't cut glass. That was precious stone overlaid gold and silver. I had me great works of art, he said. I had 4,000 chariots and horses. So many thereof, he said, that I built cities of chariots, just cities to house my chariots. And then he said... I had me 900 wives and concubines. And that was pathetic. I needed to say all these things that Solomon pursued were not all scriptural in his day. Kings of Israel were strictly forbidden to take those wives. They were furthermore strictly forbidden to build houses. They were strictly forbidden to raise horses and chariots. There were some of those, those kings, those things that he did were not permissible to kings, but Solomon did it. But he said, I, plea, play, I simply pursued these as pleasurable things. And in verse 10 of the second chapter, he says this, So I was great, and I increased more than all that were before me in Jerusalem, and also my wisdom remained with me. I didn't drop that, he said. I continued with my knowledge and my wisdom as I pursued my pleasure. And whatsoever mine eyes desired, I kept not from them. I withheld not my heart from any joy, for my heart rejoiced in all my labor and in this portion of all my labor. And then I looked on all the works that my hands had wrought and on the labor that I had labored to do, and behold, this also was the chasing of the wind. Please join us next week for the conclusion of this lesson. Thanks so much for listening. Have a great day.